Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, our uh, May webinar for NCSA. Very, very happy to be uh, presenting on a very important topic, um, insurance coverage for severe behaviors. And um, I am Jill Escher. I'm the president of NCSA, and I will be the chair today of this webinar. Um, we have four national experts um, on this topic. What we will do is um, we're going to have them speak individually. First, um, Lori Unum, then Judith Ursidi, then um, Arzu Forog, then Karen Fessel. Um, we will take questions as we go. So if there is time after each talk, I am going to interject as many questions as I can. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have time for more of a panel discussion to take even more questions. So if you have questions, I will not be monitoring the chat, um, but I will be monitoring the q and I might look at the chat, but I'll take questions only from the Q&A. So put your questions there and not in the chat. People always ask, is this being recorded? Yes, it's being recorded. And hopefully we will be able to post it today and we will send out the email today or tomorrow um, so you can see the recording and we will get um, some slides as well. So with that very brief, introduction, we are going to move straight into this webinar. And I'm very pleased to be presenting um, Lori Unum um, as our first speaker. I'm going to ask our other friends to, you can turn off your video, you can mute yourselves for now until, uh, until it's your turn. Thank you, ladies. Lori um, is absolutely a legend in this field, the legend in this field. She is uh, the CEO of the Council of Autism Service Providers, but she is best known as the architect of the autism insurance reform movement around the country. She has testified on autism insurance issues more than 100 times in legislatures around the country. And she used to have all the autism insurance mandates memorized uh, when there were only 15 of them. But now I think as we will learn, there are far more than 15. She was with Autism Speaks for many years and um, recently um, you know, moved to what we will call CASP instead of Council of Autism Service Providers. So with that, Lori, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jill. It's my pleasure to be here. And I am going to, oh, um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Can you enable so I can share my screen? I did, sorry about that. Okay, no worries. Try it again. All right, and let's see. So, do you guys see my... Indeed we can, you can do it full screen. Right now yep. it's uh, showing the next slide. Let me see if I'm doing this right. Oh, now it's just completely black for me. Oh, now it's actually huge. There, there we go. Does it look right for you? Super. Okay, great, thank you. So hi everybody, and thanks for joining us today for insurance coverage for severe behavior at any age. Um, as Jill said, my name is Lori Unum, and I'm the CEO of CASP, and I'm so happy to be here with you along with Judith and Arzu and Karen, uh, friends of mine for a very long time and um, fellow advocates uh, for autism insurance coverage. So um, I want to start, my, my comments are going to be maybe a little more introductory in nature, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to some robust Q&A with all of you toward the end. But I want to start just by kind of discussing how big of a problem is this. Um, according to Dr. Wayne Fisher from Rutgers University, who uh, specializes in severe and destructive behavior, about 16 million people in the United States have a developmental disability and about 12.5% of those or 2 million display destructive behavior. It's the largest cause of institutionalization in the US. So it's not having autism or having a developmental disability that leads one to end up um, in, in institutional housing. It's frequently the destructive behavior that is attendant to one of those disorders. But I wanna also focus for a moment. I mean, the, the Jill invited us to talk about insurance coverage for severe behavior um, across the lifespan. 
But I want to just think, take a step back and think for a moment about what exactly is the problem. Is the problem that we don't know how to treat this behavior? Is the problem that we can't get insurance coverage for it? What, what is the problem? Um, quoting Wayne Fisher again, who's a, a very good friend and, and a great practitioner, um, in a forthcoming resource that I'll highlight at the end of my talk, Wayne says, the sad irony is that getting reimbursed for services for a child with severe destructive behavior is more complex and challenging than treating the child's behavior. And as a parent of a young man with severe, challenging, destructive behaviors, that's, um, that's actually kind of an emotional statement for me to read that, that, that Dr. Fisher, who specializes in treating this severe behaviors, and has seen the worst of the worst cases during his tenure at Rutgers and at, at Kennedy Krieger and Marcus and Monroe Meyer, says it's harder to get insurance coverage than it is to treat the severe behavior. On the other hand, I'm talking to my husband, Dan, the other night about this webinar. And he says, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, getting coverage for severe behavior treatment should in some respects be easier than getting reimbursed for other autism interventions or your more typical autism interventions. Because what he sees, uh, he represents, as president of the Autism Legal Resource Center, he represents families and providers who are struggling to get appropriate insurance coverage for treatment. And what he sees sometimes are payers who will pay for ABA intervention, for example, but only if the child is exhibiting severe behavior or they're, they're looking for particular aggression or, or um, they're looking for something specific rather than just an autism diagnosis. And that always annoys Dan uh, because the state laws that Judith and Mike Wasmer and I and, and many of you probably work so hard to implement don't require autism plus a particular behavior they require coverage for autism. So from Dan's perspective, sometimes the issue is getting coverage when there's not those severe behaviors. But I think we all know, probably everybody on this webinar knows, there's still issues with getting coverage and with getting appropriate meaningful reimbursement rates. I think that's probably what Dr. Fisher was referencing for severe behaviors. So my final kind of overarching thought on trying to define the problem before we delve in any more deeply is, is the problem really the lack of coverage or is it the lack of avail available treatment professionals and centers? As the head of CASP, um, we maintain a listserv that our 200 plus providers are very active on and so frequently um, the issue is not that the child doesn't have insurance coverage, it's that they can't find any place to take their child. And so I think, of course, it's all intertwined. If there were better, more easily accessible, uh, better reimbursement rates and more easily accessible insurance funding, there would likely be more treatment centers for severe behavior. So I do recognize that it's all intertwined, but um, the lack of those treatment centers is a huge part of the problem right now. Um, I, I wanna turn to what resources currently exist this is not in any way a comprehensive list, although it may be a little closer to comprehensive than we would like. Um, Dr. Eric Larson from Lovas of the Midwest uh, really is the one who pulled this together and shared it with CAST members just a week or two ago when CAST members were collectively trying to help a, a, a fellow member find a place to refer a young man with autism, uh, with, with severe behavior, uh, and particularly adults. So this is a list and I'll, I'll share these slides with Jill and she can make them available to everyone. But um, I welcome if people have other ones that they wanna to add to this list. This is a very informal gathering of um, some intensive center-based programs or residential treatment programs that do serve adults on the spectrum. Um, one thing, I, I guess I wanna hit on a couple of things during the remainder of my time and that is um, to just make sure you're aware of the CPT codes that are specific to severe behavior. And, and secondly, I wanna talk about one piece of litigation that um, is something you should be aware of if you are struggling with insurance coverage for severe behavior patients. 
Um, so first of all, the CPT codes for severe behavior. I have to share with you guys, um, I'm in my office right now, and you know, you, you have to practically memorize these CPT codes if you're either trying to access services for a family member or you're providing them. I literally have this poster in my office with all of the CPT treatment codes and assessment codes. I've, I've got two posters. This one shows the treatment codes. And um, this is the chart that shows the um, old, actually it shows the old HICPICS codes. And then it shows the category three temporary codes for ABA or for adaptive behavior services is what the, the American Medical Association insisted on calling these codes, but they're ABA codes. And so um, in 2014, the American Medical Association CPT panel approved a set of codes for ABA, uh, approved them on a temporary basis, which means they were called category three codes. And then in 2019, the American Medical Association converted most of those codes to permanent or category one codes. And I live by these codes. I hope you all do as well if you're trying to access services. Um, but I think a lot of people maybe don't even know that two of these codes are specific to treating severe behavior. Now, one reason, there are a couple of reasons that people might not be aware of these codes. One is that there are all these rules within the American Medical Association CPT editorial panel. I, I had the good fortune of being on the ABA coding group that literally went to the meeting. There was a meeting in New Orleans in 2017, I think it was, to, uh, to make the case that these should be permanent codes for ABA. There were a handful of us there. Dr. Wayne Fisher was one, Dr. Gina Green, and so Dr. Jim Carr was there. Um, so anyway, the AMA has all these particular rules about what words you can and cannot use within the code set and they wouldn't allow us to call this code severe behavior. And so it's called exposure, adaptive behavior treatment, exposure codes. So, um, so those, there, are, there are two codes that are specific to severe behavior that did not get converted to category three permanent status but that are still available for use just because they're category, uh, oh, I said it backwards, that didn't get converted to category one status. Um, the category three status codes can still certainly be used. So, so one reason I said that people may not be aware of these is because they don't use the word severe, they use the word exposure. But then another reason is because some payers don't include these codes in their set of codes for ABA providers. And so even some providers are not aware that they're out there. You have to ask as a provider, you have to ask to have these codes for severe behavior included in the package of codes that you're allowed to bill. So um, this is, let's see, I've got the assessment code here and the treatment code on the next slide. Um, the assessment code, behavior identification supporting assessment. This code is used when two or more technicians working under the direction of a qualified healthcare professional implement one or more protocols uh, the professional developed to assess the patient's severe disruptive behavior. This code has four required components. Um, let me just pull up my assessment code here. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's 0362T and 0363T for exposure behavioral follow-up assessment um, and then follow-up in 30-minute increments after that. So um, the four required components, the billing qualified healthcare professional must be on-site during the procedure. The professional directs a team of two or more technicians to conduct the procedure. The code is used exclusively with patients who display destructive behavior, and the procedure must be implemented in an environment that is customized to the patient's specific topographies of severe destructive behavior. So this is an assessment that's not taking place in a typical doctor's office or a, a typical ABA therapy room. 
it's in a particular environment that's customized for destructive behavior. I'm not gonna read all the rest of that, but let me just move on. The adaptive behavior treatment by protocol 0373T, uh, this code is used when two or more technicians working under the development of a qualified healthcare professional implement one or more protocols the professional developed to treat the patient's destructive behavior. As described for 0362T, a professional who is on site and available must direct the service. At least two technicians must implement the service. The service is for patients with destructive behavior and the professional and technicians conduct the services in a customized environment. The professional should conduct the same safety assessment described above. So, um, so just be aware, these codes are out there. Um, if you're trying to get coverage, make sure your provider is aware and utilizing these codes because they, they understand that the notion behind these codes is that you're not gonna have one technician working uh, with one individual. You're gonna need two or maybe even more technicians with the individual. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say on the severe behavior codes. Now I wanna turn in my last few minutes to WIT versus United Healthcare, which is a lawsuit, a case um, that um, is, is useful to know about if you're struggling to get insurance coverage for care. Basically, this was not an ABA case. Um, this was a substance use disorder case. It was a class action of all these individuals who had substance use disorder and who had sought uh, treatment and had sought authorization of insurance reimbursement from United Healthcare. And United Healthcare had denied coverage to all these individuals. So a big law firm got together, brought a class action against United Healthcare for denying all of these claims. And the, the, the basis of the case was that, look, you sold all these individuals a policy that said, you cover residential care, intensive outpatient care, uh, regular outpatient care. It said you will cover that for substance use disorder. But then when, when somebody applied and tried to get that residential care or that intensive outpatient care, you applied your own internal standards or your own internal medical necessity guidelines. And by doing so, you kind of shrunk the coverage that you said these people would have. Uh, the claim was that United Behavioral Health violated its fiduciary duty and wrongfully denied claims by using its own guidelines instead of using generally accepted standards of care. And so they shrunk the, the pool of, of coverage that should have been available. There were two key questions that the court asked in the WIC case. One, what are generally accepted standards of care? And that was a pretty easy one to answer. Generally accepted standards of care are the standards that have achieved widespread acceptance among behavioral health professionals. The other question, the more difficult question was, do generally accepted standards of care exist in the substance use disorder community? And uh, basically the lawyers for the plaintiff class introduced several documents into evidence and said, yes, they, there are generally accepted standards of care in the substance use disorder community. Um, here are some examples. I'm, I'm gonna focus particularly on the, the first one in color there, the ASAM criteria. ASAM is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is you know, the relevant um, society, nonprofit organization in substance use disorder. And the court looked at this ASAM criteria and said, look, the ASAM criteria are the most widely accepted articulation of the generally accepted standards of care for how to conduct a comprehensive multidimensional assessment of a patient with substance related disorder, translate that into patient treatment needs and match those needs to the appropriate level of care. So the court basically said, look, United Healthcare, you used your own internal standards and guidelines because you wanted to, if you had wanted to see what the community generally relies on, you could have used these ASAM criteria to evaluate um, whether these patients should have been approved for care. And the court identified these generally accepted standards that it pulled from that evidence that had been submitted. Basically, 
that you should treat the underlying condition, not only the current symptoms, treat co-occurring conditions, treat at the least intensive level of care that is safe and effective, err on the side of caution, effective treatment includes services to maintain function, is any of this sounding familiar? It's not just for building skills, it also can be for maintenance. Determine the duration based on an individual's needs. Take unique needs of children and adolescents into account. They're on a different developmental path. And make level of care decisions based on, based on a multidimensional assessment. The court said in every version of the guidelines, the uh, United Healthcare's internal medical necessity guidelines, during the class period, and at every level of care that is at issue in this case, there is an excessive emphasis on addressing acute symptoms and stabilizing crises while ignoring, uh, my, that just went away, um, while ignoring the effective treatment of members' underlying conditions. The court also noted that the defect is pervasive and results in a significantly narrower scope of coverage then is consistent with generally accepted standards of care. And finally, UBH has breached its fiduciary duty by violating its duty of loyalty, its duty of due care, and its duty to comply with plan terms by adopting guidelines that are unreasonable and do not generally reflect, do not reflect generally accepted standards of care. So kind of to summarize, um, United Behavioral Health owed a duty to administer plans solely in the interest of the participants. It had promised to cover care in accordance with generally accepted standards, and instead it substituted its own guidelines that were more restrictive, and I love this second bullet, that prioritized cost savings over member interest. Um, the court said, United Behavioral Health, you cannot do that. You must use generally accepted standards of care, and the court noted multiple sources where the insurance company could have determined, could have found generally accepted standards of care. Generally, you can look at peer-reviewed studies, consensus guidelines from professional organizations, guidelines and materials distributed by government agencies like CMS. Um, as I said, the standards adopted and used by UBH were more restrictive, um, for example, generally accepted standards would have included services to maintain functioning and prevent deterioration. Um, and I've, I've already hit on, on most of these others. Um, care should not be denied on grounds that patient not responding to treatment where the patient has the potential to respond to treatment. That was another way that, um, that UBH was denying care when generally accepted standards would have required care. And then finally, the last bullet there, financial incentives infected the guideline development process. So the court was insistent that payers must look at guidelines and standards developed by outside third-party entities, not their own guidelines that may have been developed internally with um, too much focus on financial incentives of the company. Okay, um, I think I've got two minutes until my 20 minutes is up. Let me fast forward one year from that WIT versus United Behavioral Health case. The California legislature, for those of you who are in California, boy, they jumped on this right away. And I think many other states are gonna be jumping on it. The California legislature passed a bill, Senate Bill 855, that basically codifies what came out of the court in WIT versus United Behavioral Health. Uh, this, this bill was signed into law in September, and I'm gonna point you to bullet B. In conducting utilization review, uh, the, the insurers, the health plans, shall apply the criteria and guidelines set forth in the most recent versions of treatment criteria developed by the Nonprofit Professional Association for the relevant clinical specialty. So California, by law now, this is statute says, insurers must apply the guidelines set forth by a nonprofit association that's relevant to that industry. This is great because if you are being denied care for, for ABA, for disruptive behavior, uh, for inpatient care, for residential, whatever you need, 
you now can challenge that denial by asking to see the criteria that the health plan relied upon in denying and checking to see if it is consistent with generally accepted standards. Now, what do we have generally accepted standards in ABA and autism? Fortunately, yes, we do. Um, the CASP ABA treatment of ASD practice guidelines, which were developed specifically for healthcare funders and managers. Uh, this is a 50 page document that sets forth um, standards guidelines that were agreed upon by a consensus back in 2012. Uh, this document was originally created by the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. The BACB assembled a stakeholder group that reflected the consensus of the community and issued the first edition in 2012. The second edition came out in 2014. Those of you who are ABA practitioners on the, on the Zoom uh, probably consider this sort of your Bible. And um, this was transferred from the BACB to CAST at the beginning of 2020. Uh, the, and, and the BACB wanted us to have it and maintain it. And we are um, currently working on a revision to this, um, this set of standards uh, that, will, that will be the third edition. So, um, but it's very clear right within the practice guidelines, the standards presented in this document reflect the consensus of a number of subject matter experts. Um, and these guidelines were written for healthcare funders and managers, such as insurance companies. So they need to be looking at the consensus standards in this document before they deny care. Final thing I'm gonna say is that there is a resource um, that is uh, in development right now, uh, written by Dr. Wayne Fisher, Dr. Kathleen Piazza, and Ashley Furman at Rutgers called Developing a Se Severe Behavior Program, a toolkit. My understanding is that they're doing this uh, in conjunction with or for Autism Speaks. You know, Autism Speaks puts out a whole host of toolkits. And I am so excited about this document. I have a, a review copy, an, an early copy, and it is fantastic. Harkening back to what I said at the beginning, I think a lot of the problem is that there aren't enough treatment professionals and treatment clinics who know how to treat severe behavior and are willing to do so. And um, for all of you providers out there who don't serve severe and destructive behavior clients, please take a look at this toolkit when it comes out because this is Dr. Fisher who has started several of these programs, just giving you his manual. Here is the how-to manual on how you build one of these programs, how you negotiate for appropriate reimbursement rates, and it's fantastic. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Jill. I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over. Thank you, Lori. Um, okay, let's do a couple of questions and then we will move on to Judith. Um, so you did mention an ICE, a, a, a code for an assessment and a, and a code for treatment. Are there other codes that uh, we can use or that you can recommend um, to use to justify treatments for um, challenging clients? No, um, those, are, those are the two primary codes. I mean, when, when your provider is treating severe and destructive behavior, they basically need codes that they can get reimbursed for assessing the client at the, at the outset, and then codes that they use for the ongoing treatment. And so that, those are your codes. Okay. And it's always, you have to two or more practitioners, I saw, for the, for the treatment. So that seemed a little odd. I, I mean, maybe there's only one person who's available to provide the treatment. Uh, is there a reason for that? Um, well, for the severe, the types of severe behavior that I think was envisioned um, in the development of this code set, um, these are individuals who would not be safely treated by one technician. Um, th this is a two-on-one -on -one type of scenario. If, if it is an individual who can be safely treated in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, then you probably want to just use the regular treatment codes um, that are available in the CPT code set. Uh, these are specifically for the scenario where the individual cannot be treated in a one-on-one -on -one environment. It would be great to get that part of your poster if we can take a picture of it, of the list of codes, and we can put it on the, the website. 
So I might I bother you for that. Or I've got it as a Word document or a PDF, I think. So I'll try to find it um, while the other panelists are talking. Okay. Can you provide examples of a quote, customized environment as defined in the codes? Yes. Um, this, this document that I'm sharing, uh, that I shared Wayne Fisher is working on, even has some pictures of um, the customized environments that, that they use. So for example, um, there's a video camera in each treatment room that allows for remote observation and recording of sessions. Uh, the walls are the walls and doors are covered with two inch thick foam pads and it's got more um, detail about that. Um, ceiling should be durable drywall, no ceiling tiles. These are all things he's learned through his years of practice. Um, vents should be covered with hardwood or Lexan with rounded corners. Um, covered glass with Lexan, pad floors. Um, so yeah, this um, yeah, there are pictures of the treatment rooms here. So there are very specific uh, requirements or, or very specific suggestions of what would be appropriate for a severe behavior treatment room. That's not to say that any clinic has to have exactly this in order to be able to treat severe behavior, um, but these are some, some best practices to be considered. Is there an age limit for these codes? No. Okay. Um, how does this relate to Medicaid for adults with IDD and ASD in group home settings? How does this relate to Medicaid for adults with ASD and IDD in group home settings? Um, So I, I think some of the other panelists are going to cover Medicaid. I'm trying to think exactly what is being asked here. Okay. Um, it's you know, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't mean to dodge the question. Um, if you have coverage um, through private health insurance, then your coverage extends, um, well, it extends however long your state mandate says, but also probably beyond because of the... Um, impact of federal mental health parity law, which I know some of the other speakers are gonna get into. Um, Medicaid's coverage of ABA in particular is through a program called EPSDT, which extends through age 21. Um, so I, I have to think, I, I think maybe if you would ask me something more specific, we might be able to um, answer with more specificity during the Q&A. Yeah. And also, I don't can, want to take away from what the other speakers are going to talk yeah. about. We can, we can hold a lot of this stuff till, till the end. Um, do you know when the Autism Speaks Toolkit comes out? I don't know. I, I will actually email Dr. Fisher uh, during this and see if he happens to be online and will be able to let me know. All right. Someone's asking about recording. Yes, we're recording it. And the link will be posted on the page for this event. And people will receive an email about that. Um, Okay, so uh, hold on, let me get that. Um, for SB 855, do California regional centers fall into this category of insurers as payers? No. Do they have to abide by this? So he, someone's ta asking about California regional centers. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but Karen Fessel is shaking her head no, so I would trust Karen's knowledge on that. It's a totally separate system. Totally separate system. Yeah. So hopefully there'll be, we can talk about that maybe later. Um, have people accessed uh, treatments uh, through their insurance coverage for their kids? So I guess somebody's saying like in real life, people have used these codes. People have accessed services. Oh, yeah. You've oh, yeah. seen this happen. Maybe oh, give it yeah. given all, give the an, all the time. Uh, maybe just give two little quick examples of... Um, how you've seen this work successfully? Oh, I mean, um, the all the clinics that I named, um, Kennedy Krieger, Marcus, Rutgers, Monroe Meyer, Therapeutic Pathways in California, um, they're, they're billing these severe behavior codes every day yeah. for multiple clients. And your, your general ABA agency off the street, they can also use the codes? They can if they've negotiated to have them in their their set in their contract. So every 
ABA provider contracts with each payer. So they have a separate contract. Uh, so ABA Clinic X has a contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield. They have a contract with Cigna. They have a contract with Aetna. And they have to negotiate which CPT codes are within the realm of the services that they bill. So the ABA provider needs to tell the insurance company, I intend to serve individuals with disruptive behavior and thus I need to have these severe behavior codes in my contract. Now the ABA provider will have to uh, demonstrate that they've got the customized treatment program or room or whatever available. Because if they don't have this customized environment, then the payer is just going to say, well, you're not really providing that kind of specialized services. Maybe you have a tough kid here or there, but if you don't have the padded room or whatever, you're probably not providing the kind of services that require two-on-one technician to client and that require the use of this specialized code. Yeah. I guess I'm a little bit uneasy because I think, you know, in my experience, most people want these interventions in the home, you know, and um, I don't know if these codes would allow for like practitioners to come into the home and work with a kid or an adult. Um, I don't know that that's ever been tested. I don't think that was envisioned to be perfectly honest, but just because it wasn't envisioned doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what was envisioned when these codes were being developed were the specialized, you know, not quite hospitalization, but, but really intensive treatment programs that require, you know, a 10 or a 12 week stay, essentially. Got it. Okay, well, let's move on. There's so much more to be covered. Thank you so much, Lori. And hang on, because we'll get back to you in the, um, when there's Q&A later. Judith Arcidi uh, recently joined CASP as Vice President of Community Affairs after 12 years at Autism Speaks, working to pass and implement autism insurance reform legislation across the nation. She did that with Lori. She is the mom to Jack, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and is on the severe end of the spectrum and who has struggled with self-injurious and challenging behaviors. Judith, turning it over to you. Oh, it is the worst thing in the world to follow Lori Unum. It's just the worst, <laughs> but I'm gonna power through. Um, and let me get my screen shared quickly. Okay. And I'm actually gonna start with my final slide rather than my initial. Let me get this out of the way. One moment. Yeah, you're not yet full screen. Okay, here we go. Yes, so I just wanted to start to say to all of you who are in attendance today that I feel you. I feel you very much. This is a photograph um, of just an injury that I experienced. Many of you have had far worse. I've had several of these. Um, and I, this is an autism, a severe challenging behaviors induced injury. Um, and this is something that I don't post on my Facebook page or, you know, for, for respect of my child and all those sorts of things. I don't share this sort of thing, but I just say that to say, I know where you're coming from. I, I feel what you feel. And so hopefully what we're sharing today will be helpful. I know there's so much information to get through. So I'm going to now go to my first slide. Just one second. Okay, here we go. All right, um, Lori has already mentioned the work of CASP, so I'm not gonna go into a long explanation of that, just to say that uh, I know Lori and I spent many years, Mike Wasmer did too, and Lori was leading us at Autism Speaks in passing autism insurance reform legislation. Um, it was incredible work and Autism Speaks continue, continues to do great work. Um, I'm so thrilled to be at CASP now where we're really working to make sure that all these laws that were passed are meaningful and that um, the services that are being provided are of quality evidence-based um, and they make a difference for families like yours. So just know we're out there trying to make a difference as a trade association for these providers. I also wanna make sure that you all are aware of an appeals guide that we have at CASP that is incredible. Um, 
I put a link in my presentation. So you'll have that when we share it later after the webinar. So just this appeals guide is a wonderful resource if you want to really geek out and try to write an appeal, know what your rights are, things like that. Um, it looks at acronyms. It gives background about kind of the type of health insurance that you have. I know people were saying, hey, what happens in my group home with Medicaid? What happens with the regional system? Knowing what's what and how the systems are are parsed out is helpful. You have to know that. So this really helps walk through that. It walks through the administrative and clinical appeals process. It looks at in depth, we've already mentioned before, mental health parity. Um, so that does apply to autism. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then our zoo is really going to share a lot more. Um, it focuses on best practice for drafting those appeal letters. Yay, good times having to write appeal letters, but it provides some really helpful information. So this is available and it's not just providers that can use it, it's for families. So definitely when you get the webinar, um, check it out. And I'll actually, I'll put a link into when I'm done um, in the Q&A box so that you all can see it. Um, what I wanted to do today is take a step back and some of you feel free to just insert the eye roll emoji in the Q&A box if you want to, because you might think, wow, this is so basic. I do not need to know this information. But I'm really surprised sometimes about how around the country people are not completely aware of the laws and regulations that are on the books that can be helpful. So I just want to provide a quick overview of those to you so that you are aware and just know too that there are links available in the presentation so you can dig a little deeper. So first of all, the really great news is no matter what state you live in in the United States of America, there is a requirement for state regulated plans to cover evidence-based autism treatments. Um, and so you can see under the map there that the journey started back in 2001 with Indiana and Tennessee was the 50th state um, to pass a requirement in 2019. So whether you've experienced the consequences of that or not, there is a law or regulation in your state that requires coverage. So please be aware of that. Um, it requires coverage of medically necessary diagnosis and treatment for people diagnosed with autism. The laws look different. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but just know that information is available and I've provided a link where you can find an FAQ for your state to find out what your state law does. Um, if there is like an age cap or something like that in the law. So definitely check out that link for an FAQ for your state. I think there's always a big impression of like, well, oh, those are just ABA laws. Like they're only for little kids who are getting early intervention. I don't really, I'm dealing with a teenager who is having severe challenge in behavior. This doesn't really apply to me. No, that's actually not true. The vast majority of the states have age caps that land in like the 18 to 21 year old range. Um, that is not a stop sign or an end point. Just know that those laws are continually being amended and changed. In Virginia, for example, session before last, we went back and got rid of that age cap. Some states do not have an age cap at all right now. So in the previous slide, I did mention that there's information about your state laws at that link. So you can find out for sure what the age cap is in your state if there is one. So just know that there's coverage for not only the cute three and four year olds who also can be challenging, I will totally concede that, but also for your elementary school, middle school, high school adults. Um, and it covers things um, including applied behavior analysis, behavioral health treatments, occupational therapy, psychological services, psychiatric services, speech therapy. Um, so it covers, generally these laws cover an array of interventions. As I said before, you'll wanna click through and look at the specifics in your state. But I feel like a lot of people just make an assumption, this is an ABA bill for little kids. It's not, it's definitely not. Um, and also please know, as I mentioned before, that there are efforts continuing nationwide to ensure that no matter how old you are, no matter where you live, no matter what type of health insurance coverage you have, that you do have access to this basic care that can make a difference. Um, 
Additionally, that was all about private health insurance. When you think about the public piece, Medicaid, um, great strides have been taken there as well. So back in 2014, and many of you may already be aware of this, CMS, which is the federal agency that oversees Medicare and Medicaid, finally put out a bulletin um, saying that Medicaid coverage really is required for autism spectrum disorder. Um, autism spectrum disorder is what they call a childhood health condition. Um, and so treatment is required under a provision called EPSDT. And our zoo is gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so fortunately, this was a big step forward. I will say, unfortunately, child, the definition means individuals under the age of 21. So this informational bulletin did not specifically apply to adults. More work needs to be done in that space. But if you fall in, under the age of 21, then it does apply. So that's been many, many years ago now, July of 2014. Um, and so far, 47 states have taken action to implement this coverage. And um, those who are Medicaid enrolled children under the age of 21 can access medically necessary autism treatment. The three outlying states that have not implemented yet, and some of you who are on this webinar are working on this with me, um, New York, Texas, and Illinois are still dragging their feet, I would say, in implementing this very important coverage for Medicaid kids. Um, on the adult side, um, New Mexico actually passed a provision a couple of years ago now for adults saying, okay, we know that the federal government, CMS, is saying this applies to those under the age of 21. We acknowledge and know that adults need similar coverage for those Medicaid enrolled folks. So New Mexico is working on that. I know in Massachusetts, there's a bill in the legislature to expand past the age of 21 and just to make it equal for adults. Um, so those efforts are ongoing across the country. The other piece, when you think about Medicaid, we talked about the CMS memo, and that really talks mostly about what we call state plan services. And to simplify it, that's kind of the health insurance piece of Medicaid. Um, there are also benefits under Medicaid that are called waiver services, and those are the things that are kind of outside of the health insurance piece. And I'm speaking very simplistically, and most of you probably already know about home and community-based services that are provided through Medicaid waivers. Um, but I want to make sure that everyone knows about that. So you can access supports and services through HCBS. Um, the wait lists for those services are devastating, staggering, just impossible almost to exist on and to survive. But it is important um, that if you have a loved one with severe challenging behaviors and autism, even if you feel like you'll never get past the wait list of 50,000 people in Texas or whatever the number is in Florida, um, get the, your name on the list. If you click at this link, you can find the contact for your state Medicaid agency, reach out to them, and please make sure that you are on the wait list um, for these services if there is a wait list in your state. You can see this chart looks at the wait list for home and community-based services, these Medicaid waiver services, um, and the wait lists in total nationally have just totally grown. So it's almost you know a million people now on the wait list nationwide for home and community-based services under Medicaid. But as I mentioned before, um, when you're in the community receiving these services, if you're living in a group home, you might be part of a day program. All those sorts of things are funded through what they call HCBS. So make sure you're on the list because supports for people with challenging behaviors, although very lacking, do exist in that system. So get on the list. The other thing I want to mention too, when we talk about how do you get help, where is it going to come from? So we talked about private health insurance. We talked about Medicaid health insurance, Medicaid waiver services. Um, there's also a federal law, and this is back to the private health insurance piece that was passed back in 2008 
Um, and I remember I was actually working for Autism Speaks at the time. And I was at one of the Autism Speaks walks in Rhode Island and I was working at our Autism Votes booth and up walked Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Um, and he said, hi, he's like, I'd love to talk to the crowd today about this new law that I finally got passed called mental health parity. And I remember thinking, well, what does that have to do with anything? Like, I mean, I, I wasn't angry about it, but I thought, well, you know, I don't know how much that's gonna help people with autism, which was completely ignorant on my part. Um, but he did speak to the crowd that day and offered them hope and I wish I'd known then what I know now, because truly this law has had a profound effect upon our population. Our zoo is gonna go into more detail about it, but I will say just very simply, um, what it does is it says that if you have a health plan, a private health insurance plan that offers behavioral health treatment, mental health treatment, then you can't put greater limits on that than you do on the medical benefits that you provide. So it's all about fairness and parity. Um, and there are state parity laws too. And I've got some links here that you can go to to look at those state parity laws. And some of you may say, well, autism is not a mental health disorder. This is not mental health. So I know that's kind of an argument that's had in the community. But when you think about it from a legal perspective, um, the autism definition um, exists in the DSM, the DSM-5. I have this little pocket version I keep on my desk. Um, and so autism spectrum disorder is defined here. The criteria are here. And so this book is the diagnostic manual for mental disorders. So from a legal perspective, autism is a mental disorder and any treatment that is a result of this mental disorder, autism, legally speaking again, um, mental health parity applies to it. Um, so it is relevant. There's been much litigation and enforcement around the country and that continues. Um, so it's something that can really make a big difference when um, the behavioral health treatments related to autism are being limited. So just know that mental health parity like other laws only applies to certain plans. It's a federal law, so it actually applies to a lot of plans. There's a comprehensive list in that CASP appeals guide that I mentioned earlier. So if you really want to drill down and see if it applies to your plan, um, you can look there. I'm not going to read through all of this other information because I think Arzu is actually going to go through it in her presentation. Just know that when they're looking to compare mental health benefits to the medical ones, they don't look in a holistic way, they look in categories. So they're gonna compare classifications like the benefits in your inpatient and network plans on the mental health or behavioral side versus those on the medical side. So this is kind of just a list of the way they look at the categories. So that's a specific breakdown there for you. And new tools, um, for enforcement are being developed all the time. If you're an employee, for instance, and you think that your employer plan is really not complying with mental health parity, you can request as an employee that um, your plan provide information via this disclosure template, and they have to do it within 30 days. So that's just kind of one tool. There's a self-compliance tool that the U.S. Department of Labor has developed for health plans so they can assess and see if they're in compliance. That goal is to try to make them think about mental health parity and design their plans accordingly. We would hope that it's not something that the plans would exploit, you know, and try to manipulate to their benefit, but it is something that helps them sort of self audit. Um, and then there's also a new requirement um, that um, federal regulators can come in and really ask for a comparative analysis of plans um, specific to the non quantitative treatment limits. So things around medical necessity, things like that. Um, so these are all new enforcement things. Um, mental health parity is something that can be taken seriously, can have an impact on the way services are delivered, including those for severe challenging behaviors. 
Um, and even though I didn't realize that back when Patrick Kennedy called, told me in 2008, it truly is something um, that has made a difference. And as I said before, um, please stay in touch. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help with any efforts that you have going on regarding any of this um, and we'll provide my contact information with the slides when this is over. Thank you, Judith. Um, great information. Um, let's see, we have a question. And this is something, we hear similar things to this all the time. Um, the issue I've had with my severe ASD son, who's 18, there in Georgia, mm. uh, two providers, speech and OT dropped us and said their, their contract only went to age 18 and there are no available providers in our area. How can they make you change from a provider you've had for 10 years? It feels like a loophole created to, to basically avoid you know, the older children. Right, well, I know the Georgia Autism Insurance Law requires coverage through the age of 20. And so I'm not sure why the cutoff has been 18. Um, so if this person actually, I'll put my email in the Q&A if they wanna email back and forth with me, um, we can talk about what's in the law in Georgia. Sometimes providers too just aren't motivated to serve the population. So I'm not sure if that's the case here where the provider is part of the problem. But I will say the law in Georgia goes to age 20, which is not high enough, um, so. Yeah, and I, I know that we'll get into this um, hopefully um, in, in the next hour, but um, one problem we hear about all the time are providers just won't take our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and somebody's saying, what about Medicare? Um, I can't answer that question. <laughs> I know okay. there are dual enrollees and that's just a whole other cup of tea that I, I do not have any expertise. Does Lori want to? Well, I, I, I need more. What do you mean? What about, what about, what about Medicare? <laughs> <laughs> right. Give me some more information about the question. I, I what yeah, you Camilla, ask? feel free to type in more if you would like. Um, okay. So listen, let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you so much, Judith. Let's move on. Cause I, I do want to save that time at the end to have a more of a panel discussion. Arzu, um, I will, uh, tell you about Arzu. She is president and CEO of the Washington, Washington that's Washington State um, Autism Alliance. She is a nationally recognized trailblazer and advocate. She has both personal and professional experience with severe challenging behaviors and crisis stabilization. Her talk is about maximizing access to care at any age. Thank you, Arzu. Thank you, Jill. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Great. All right, so I am the proud parent of two on the autism spectrum. One of them has significant developmental and communication delays. You will likely hear him throughout my conversation with you. Um, he's had um, significant developmental communication and a long history of severe challenging behaviors. I founded Washington Autism Alliance in 2007 out of personal necessity in order to prepare Washington State for lifelong support of people like our sons. We provide legal services, individual case management and multi-state navigation for individuals and families throughout Washington State. Part of my talk um, is likely a review of what you already know really well. My hope is that together we can identify some ways to bolster the support network that's been available to you. Um, all of us know that um, we know our children better than anyone else. We are the glue that binds our support network together. We're also in the thick of things, emotionally vulnerable. Sometimes, um, if not most of us, have endured years of trauma associated with severe challenging behaviors. As such, my presentation will emphasize trauma-informed, family-focused care and services while ensuring everyone's safety. Um, first, I'm going to review the anatomy of challenging behaviors, um, which was covered, by the way, very well in the last webinar of um, National Council for um, Severe Autism in April. If you haven't watched, please do. Then I'm going to review all the funding sources that are available to your loved ones, as well as making sure everyone, again, is kept safe. Um, finally, I'm going to review how to find qualified providers that have the right level of expertise and experience to join your team, especially those who understand co-occurring mental disorders and, again, trauma-informed care. Um, in my next two slides, I want you to imagine you were unexpectedly dropped somewhere in this picture. Try to hear some of the noise. 
Imagine all the different movements and activities around you. Smell of fumes, other smells that might be offensive to your senses. Now imagine no one speaks your language. What is your reaction? How do you get yourself out of this situation? As you know, some people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism, don't have a filter for sight, light, noise, and smells. People find themselves in this type of sensory overload are attempting to solve a problem. And not being able to process all the information coming at them, their coping strategies aren't always safe. Um, in absence of healthy coping strategies, our loved ones engage in very serious challenging behaviors that significantly jeopardize their health and safety. We know, oops, there we go. Um, we know um, our person of interest has difficulty communicating their wants and needs. They resort to using behaviors that um, when, when they perceive a crisis. And also challenging behaviors can have more than one cause. These causes change frequently. Add to that complexity is that home and community-based interventions are often watered down and effective programming and supports don't come into the picture until an individual and family are in crisis. So I will stress the importance of not getting outnumbered along the way. We know best practice guidelines recommend remediation programs that are effectively designed and delivered by the medical community, by therapy providers, families and schools, and other providers working well together and achieving consensus and consistency. So much like this crib mobile, if one of those systems is missing or broken, this whole mobile will break. In order for our loved ones with complex social, emotional, and behavioral disorders to thrive, all of these systems play an integral and an interconnected role. <clears throat> they need school-based health services. By that, I mean school-based behavior therapy, neurodevelopmental therapies, and much more. They also need medical and therapeutic interventions that are in theory covered by all forms of health benefits. And for those who are eligible, also they need services that are covered by Medicaid waivers, which as Judith mentioned, Right now, nationally, we have close to a million people who are waiting for these services. I will talk about each of these health benefits in the later slides. Medicaid and many private insurance carriers require treatment to be medically necessary before covering. Your child, your son or daughter's um, doctor can write a letter to support this if your health plan puts an unreasonable cap or denies benefits. A letter of medical necessity has to show that the member's symptoms have a negative impact on development and or communication and or demonstrating injurious behaviors. This is different than the treatment plan that is developed by specialists. The person who prescribes the care is typically not the same person who delivers these services. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in slides. Let's um, look at what the laws say. We know um, Judith covered this and Lori covered some of this. We have, no matter what type of insurance your son or daughter has, there are laws that give them rights and protections. The four laws that I want to highlight are early periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment, ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, as well as the state and federal mental health parity laws. The early periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment is required healthcare benefit for all Medicaid eligible children three to 21 years old. Simply put, it's the program that the autism benefits fall under for children who have Medicaid. In Washington state, we only had the E and the P, sometimes the D, but the T of the actual therapies were not covered at all. So in 2011, our organization reached a settlement with the state of Washington over screening, diagnosis, and evidence-based treatment, including applied behavior analysis, as well as neurodevelopmental therapies for all children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including autism. Uh, the um, ERISA, is a federal law that sets the standard for most retirement and health benefit plans that are offered by the private sector employers. The Department of Labor provides oversight over ERISA plans. 
ERISA establishes minimum standards for health, retirement, and other welfare benefit plans that are established by the employer. Families have the right under ERISA to file claims in court after exhausting all internal appeals process. Other participants' rights include access to plan information, timely and fair process for benefit claims, also notice to benefit of benefit determination and access to all records. In addition to ERISA, if your plan is issued and delivered in Washington state, you also have these the, the following rights per the Washington State Bill of Rights. You have adequate choice among healthcare providers, which means you have access to healthcare providers who have the appropriate training, skills, and experience for the treatment of your child's needs. You also have the right to an adequate network of healthcare, pro healthcare providers which is loosely defined as access to providers who are no more than 30 miles away from your home and have the ability to start treatment within 30 days. If you are protected by the Washington's Patient Bill of Rights, you can request an out-of-network waiver if you can demonstrate that there's not an appropriate provider in your area that can see your child within a reasonable amount of time. There are two mental health parity laws. Some states, such as Washington and Oregon, have state mental health parity. And in um, the other is the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act. I um, want to go back to some of the state mandates. In Washington state, our mental health parity was passed in 2005. But as we found out after moving to Washington in 2006, it really wasn't implemented. And it wasn't until our family brought a, st a statewide lawsuit against the state of Washington that we started seeing coverage of the state mental health parity laws being implemented in Washington. Um, the other um, important factor about the federal mental health parity laws is that it regulates Medicaid. We, um, as, as I said before, the EPSDT benefit stops at 21. Some of our existing mandates in Washington state and in other states um, stop before the age 21. We've never come across a person who is no, elig no longer eligible for medical benefits, right? At seven years old, at 10 years old, at 12 years old or 21 years old. So to place an age cap on autism diagnosis and treatment is inconsistent with parity. And again, since we know that Medicaid is governed by the federal mental health parity, in Washington, we pursued Medicaid reform for those who are over 21. Um, in 2019, once again, a settlement was reached in 2020 for coverage of those who are older to access all screening, diagnosis, and treatment, including applied behavior analysis and neurodevelopmental therapies for those who are 21 and older. And, and neurodevelopmental therapies are speech therapy, occupational therapy. Um, feeding therapies for those who need it. Insurers, as Judith said, must provide the same annual and lifetime dollar limits, co-payments, deductibles, co-insurance, and out-of-pocket expenses, and authorization requirements for day and visit limits. If you or your family are working, um, a family that you're working with has an insurance plan and mental health coverage, which is required under the Affordable Care Act, the mental health parity applies. Your benefits specialist or an insurance navigator can help you determine which mental health parity um, laws apply to your specific plan. If you're unsure of what insurance, uh, what your insurance policy covers or doesn't cover, the first step is to verify insurance coverage. You can do this in multiple ways. As Judith explained, they have a very um, comprehensive resource on their website. Another way is by calling your insurance company, your insurance case manager, or your employer's HR benefit specialist to see what your insurance plan covers for ASD and other DD treatment. You can also request a copy of your plan document. Sometimes that's called a certificate of coverage from your insurance or your employer. Now let's talk about how to access benefits under Medicaid. The first thing you need um, for, to know is that all plans 
are included that that all plans provide coverage for screening diagnosis and treatment of autism under Medicaid. Most of the therapies and treatments that are expensive um, require a prior authorization. As an example, applied behavior analysis or any um, therapeutic boarding schools, any um, intensive services are going to require a prior authorization. Most of the therapies and treatment can be accessed through a prescription, uh, but it has to come from a, an approved provider under Medicaid. You can find providers by calling your um, particular insurance plan under Medicaid. And as Judith mentioned, there are many wait lists. The wait lists can be quite long. For this reason, we recommend calling everyone and referring back to the list of providers frequently because we know new providers can be added um, to the networks. Also, if you do have Medicaid and have been on a waiting list longer than four months, we recommend you start an appeal process to get an exception to the rule to get um, a, a, another provider added to the network who's willing to accept Medicaid. The other thing that I want to mention about rates, at least in Washington state, we have poor reimbursement rates that impact the, um, the number of people who are in network. I hope that we can have a conversation at a later date about how we can improve these reimbursement rates. Our priority is to keep our family members in the least restrictive environment and find community placements so that children don't have to go to an institutional placement. However, Nationwide, we are alerted to the crisis of people with IDD residing in hospitals when they have no medical need. Often providers and families can no longer support the individual's behavioral challenges and are left with no other alternative but to take them to an emergency room and refuse to take them back home. Washington State is addressing this by transitioning people with intellectual and developmental disabilities from hospitals to state-operated habilitation centers and out-of-state residential programs for adolescents and teenagers. Families have one goal in mind, finding the best possible treatment that you can. Whether you're struggling with a mental health issue or behavioral problems, you want to find a treatment team or center with optimal combination of therapeutic methods, treatment philosophy, and proven effective outcomes. Therapeutic me methods should be data-driven and based on sol solid scientific evidence. Treatment philosophy should resonate with you and sound like a great fit for your sons and daughters. The outcomes should have verifiable track record of positive results for adolescents and adult population. Applied behavior analysis ticks all of these boxes. It's evidence-based, has a viable track record of positive outcomes. Of course, you also want experienced, highly trained team of psychiatrists, therapists, and support track, uh, staff. We try our hardest to keep children and adults safely in their own homes, but there are situations where this can't be accomplished safely in regular schools, in home and community set settings. The progression then is to look at hospital-based day programs and specialty schools. And I'll speak more into the steps that are needed for eligibility of all these options. This is just a, a reminder and a note to self that as families, we know our own children better than anyone else. So we need to be really involved with the assessment, uh, with the assessment team and make sure that the plans are a good fit both for our individual person with disability as well as the entire family to be most effective. We also want to make sure that the behavior specialists, regardless of the funding source that we have in, if in your state applied behavior analysis is not recognized by some of your funding sources, then positive behavior support is one that you could ask for. The specialist has to be a PhD or master's level therapist with expertise in positive behavior support in the family context. They will conduct FBAs, functional behavior assessments, design written positive behavior support plans. They provide training and consultations. They collect data, they review this data, and they provide oversight. And the behavior technicians are the experienced line therapists that implement the plan. We know that a wraparound approach 
provides a holistic view of each person's interactions and supports in different settings, which more fully informs the team and the plan and the individual support plan. Team members are chosen by the individual and family. That includes family members, friends, community members, service providers, school staff, and other service system representatives. We also want to make sure that families have access to family systems counseling, predictable routines with minimal unstructured time. Case managers um, are encouraged to identify, identify all natural supports as well as ensuring culturally appropriate goals as well as familial or caregiver values. Also high, of high priority is the health of family members and caregivers. We know there's no quick fixes to severe challenging behaviors. There's no magic pill. There's no magic word that will instantly cause the behavior to stop. So effective behavioral change will require time and consistency and the right team to keep everyone safe. Regrettably, home and community-based services are woefully underfunded and inadequate and force individuals into more institutionalized level of care. Remember, safety of everyone is always top priority in any situation. If a person is in an active cycle of severe escalation, especially an adolescent and adult, it's going to need three people to safely de-escalate and for a minimum amount of physical prompts to be needed to protect the safety of the person of interest, as well as the supporting staff. If a staff member is the monitor, they should not be permitted to participate in the physical prompting. So the number of people specified in an intervention plan should be stating that a staff member will monitor the intervention and that the monitor is empowered to intervene to end physical prompts and possible safe holds. In addition, training calls for certain types of safe holds and restraints to be administered by two people so that the feasibility of always having a staff monitor who is not engaged in the restraint is often questionable. As a practical matter, matter um, this may be difficult to implement um, if it's not explicitly stated in the intervention plan or the treatment plan. And this is what I meant by not, don't get outnumbered. It's hard to get commitment from payers, whether it's school districts, health plans, or states, to ensure that they adopt positive, state, uh, positive behavior support programs that are adequately staffed. These programs help prevent the types of behavior that lead adults to believe that their only resource is to isolate and restraint. We also recommend including a statement that the payers and staff, including educational staff and all other supports like bus drivers, are required to get training in de-escalation as well as specialized training in responding to explosive behavior that, is off, that often results in isolation and restraint. Um, in Washington state, restraint is prohibited except when a student's behavior presents imminent likelihood of serious harm to self and another person. We maintained that there is no such thing as a safe restraint. So intervention plans need to set the tone for the entire team. Care plans require reviews of individuals that are subject to multiple instances of isolation and restraint to, uh, to address whether the functional behavior assessment should be performed or evaluated, whether an existing intervention plan should be revised. And the assessment should also include consideration of caregiver fatigue, caregiver um, uh, other illnesses uh, in the home. Okay, let's talk about steps that you can take towards building a case for partial hospitalization. Partial hospitalization is when this, the person attends a day school or a specialty school that's based in a hospital. If you haven't already, start consulting a seasoned educational consultant. This could be a psychologist, a PsyD, or an educator. These consultants focus on at-risk youth and have three areas of expertise and experience. Assessment of the individual social, emotional, and academic needs, evaluation of academic and treatment systems, and direct intervention and communication with adolescents and their families. 
But more importantly, these educational consultants are typically very familiar with both specialty schools as well as therapeutic boarding schools and can make recommendations on placement options. This person will often work with you and your advocates to build a case for either partial hospitalization or therapeutic boarding schools. You can ask this person to complete a comprehensive needs assessment of your son and daughter's social, emotional, and academic needs. Ideally, they should observe your children in multiple settings, including school, in structured and unstructured settings. For the therapeutic boarding school, the considerations are, has there been a lack of, in, um, of adequate stabilization and reduction of severe dangerous behaviors? What interim placements are there necessary in order for the person to enter a therapeutic boarding school, such as a, a wilderness program? Are there any step down programs available when your son or daughter is ready to come back home? And who pays? School districts often require the involvement of a special education attorney. Health plans pay for the, Medicaid, the medical, behavioral, and neurodevelopmental therapies. Medicaid waivers, unfortunately, do not cover institutional placements, which is what they called therapeutic boarding schools. And Karen is going to speak in depth about that, so I will um, I will defer to her. Where you can find some self-advocacy tools, this is um, on our website. We have a comprehensive list of school-based services. In addition, oops, sorry. In addition, we have um, resources for um, addressing unreasonable caps or denials, whether you have private insurance or Medicaid. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Arzu. Um, let's see. Um, I think anybody can chime in on, on these questions, any of our panelists, but um, what would you recommend to a family whose BSP behavior something plan, behavior support plan. support plan, does note a requirement for three or more staff for safe access to the community. And the state Medicaid where they reside says that no more than one is allowed. I, I would say they need to appeal that based on medical necessity. This is what I was talking about that some of the home and community based um, plans are inadequately staffed, but the family should make a case for an exception to the rule, regardless of whatever the funding source is for that uh, behavior support plan. As a follow-up, is the state allowed to use the parent, e.g. the natural support, as one of the multi-person staff requirement? In, um, if you're 18 years old or older, your parent can get um, credentialed to become one of your providers. However, um, as, as a personal, in my own personal experience, um, if my family member has significant challenging behaviors, I want to make sure that there are other hands available to me because I'm exhausted, I have this history of trauma associated with severe explosive behaviors. And so I need the support of additional paid staff members to get me out of situations where I need to tag someone and get myself out of that situation. Got it. Um, someone asked, could you please display your last slide for a few seconds? Um, the last slide, yes. Okay. Um, some of the information is confusing around the issue of age and school age. Um, a huge support and funding is gone after school. True. Um, hard to determine how to use this info as it does seem to be state specific though. So maybe you can speak to 
just the adults, just after age, you know, 22 and up. Yep, um, absolutely. If, yeah. So important to remember, as Judith mentioned, that there is no age limit on the federal mental health parity, which also regulates Medicaid. So there is no age limit when, when a person turns 21. That doesn't mean that we have an adequate network of providers. We have the coverage, but it's still challenging to find people who know how to work with a person in a man's body and a woman's body and are able to do it safely. It's, um, which is why we are trying not to limit the provider types that are able to provide behavior support. Um, but the, there is, it is, you're absolutely right. There, one of those very important systems is gone at 21. Yeah, I think that the um, lack of providers uh, willing to work with this population is probably the issue we hear about most from, from our community. Yeah. All right, Arzu, I think we're gonna move along to Karen. Thank you so much. Um, and then again, we're gonna hold time at the end um, for um, group discussion. Karen Fessel, um, you can turn on your video so we can see you and you can unmute yourself. Karen was drafted into the autism insurance arena when she encountered major roadblocks in getting reimbursement for medically necessary treatment for her son with autism. Armed with a doctorate in public health and experience working for California's largest HMO, she founded the Mel Mental Health and Autism Insurance Project in 2009 in order to help families get insurance funded um, for medically necessary treatments. She, along with our dearly missed late VP, Feda Almalidi, was active in getting California's autism insurance mandate passed into law. Karen. Uh, All right, we still no, don't see you. Yeah, yep. it says that you you turned me off. <laughs> oh, so I have to you restart have to you. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. Oh, okay, no. here. Here we go. Okay, start my video. There okay. you are. Sorry about that. And now <laughs> add my slides. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, are you not seeing them, I suppose. Let me see if I can. Yeah, just do a from beginning sure, you should there be you go. okay um so this talk is about hospitalization and residential treatment for those with severe asd are we still in the dark ages we still Sorry don't see your that. slides so okay, there we go this talk is dedicated to feta almalidi a dear dear friend who i dearly miss um i'm not seeing and, your slides are they on huh? no oh. okay um hmm uh, display settings, uh, you know, what do you need me to do? It's, it, hmm. Um, okay. Share screen. What happens when, when you, when you hit share screen? Uh, I'm going to have to put this down. Okay. Whoops. I'm going to. So okay. you see the little up arrow above share screen at the bottom. What happens when you click uh, on that? Nope. And I've lost the visual. Um, oh no. Okay. Back to the zoom. Let me go back to zoom. Here we go. Okay. So share screen view, exit full screen, at the, uh, at the share screen at uh, the very bottom, right? Bottom. The ticker at the bottom, right Not next video. to chat, chat, share screen. There we go. Sorry. Okay. And now, uh, sorry about that. Hmm uh powerpoint slideshow no okay Not sharing okay i have two screens so maybe if i bring it oh, up oh one of those two screen people yes. yeah that okay. okay so so now um slideshow uh no Hey, Karen, uh, typically, if you share the very first icon that you see after you hit share screen, it will mm -hmm. display whatever's on your main monitor. You don't have to select slideshow. You can just, uh, it'll display whatever you pull up on your on your main monitor. Okay. Um, so you hit share screen and then you clicked on the right visual, the right icon. Um, okay. Share screen and then tell us what you see. Okay. 
um, share. You see? Uh, yeah, you're doing it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, okay, Karen. So let me go back. Go uh, let me see if I can go backwards. No. Um, but you're still seeing this. Okay. Well, we might have yeah. to go forwards. Oh, I'm so sad. Um, Will your arrow keys um, move it no, back? We're not just arrow keys on your keyboard. No. Uh, Sometimes displaying. I'm so sorry. You are sharing your screen. Uh, yeah, and I'm using the arrow keys on my keyboard, and they're not working. Mm. Um, so pause share, resume share. Sorry that. I'm so sorry about this. Um, I found this happens when people have multiple screens. We run into. Pause. You know what? If I unplug this, I'm going to take a chance. Now, what do you see? Your screen's still up. Um, here's okay. Screen. Now, there we go. All right. Okay. So. Uh, previous and previous. Whoops, it's going forward. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so in memoriam of my dear friend Feta Al Malidi for educating me on the challenges of severe autism and not taking no for an answer. She died in a house fire trying to save her son, and she is forever with me. And um, her son used to have, um, he used to uh, get he'd get like just the regular flu and he'd get um, so depressed and so de like he would stop eating. And she had to bring him into the hospital to get IVs and they would strap him down and he would pull them out. And it was a constant battle just to keep him alive through the, the normal flu. And so I think of her when I did some of this research, she was constantly in my mind. So um, what happens when behaviors become unmanageable? Well, Children with severe, often it happens when they hit adolescence and um, they get bigger than their parents. Hormones kick in and they have developmental changes. Um, so some of the, the things that make severe autism, um, the behaviors that are red flags are danger to self and others. And some of the things that we see are elopement, repeated physical aggression, frequent serious self-injury, um, sleep disturbance, property destruction, school expulsion, pica, um, severe decreases in functioning. And um, a red flag, sometimes they're unpredictable even with really well done fit functional behavior assessments. So um, these are, and then it cannot often, uh, what, what I'm talking about here um, when they need like, uh, higher levels of care. It cannot be addressed through uh, regular behavior treatments. The person cannot be de-escalated um, and they pose an urgent threat but cannot be contained. And often when this happens, the main choice is to call 911 and get your um, local emergency services involved. Um, and there's something new on the horizon and it's called 988. And it's a specific emergency line devoted specifically to mental health issues. Uh, I'm sorry, to mental health crises. The FCC has approved 988 as an emergency number specifically for those in mental health crises. And this was a bill that was passed last year, Senate Bill 2661. Um, it is specifically designated for suicide prevention um, and uh, LGBT youth at risk. Um, they, that's what they, that's who they name, but it also um, specifically states that it's for those um, uh, specialized um, high risk populations. So ASD is not specifically defined and I encourage you to get involved with your state legislators because how this is rolling out is gonna be different in each state. And I encourage you to get involved with your local state legislator and ask them what they are doing to make 988 available and will the people be able to deal with severe autism and crises related to that. Um, they will be, it's going live um, July in July of 2022. Calls are routed to local crisis centers where trained counselors will answer and they can direct crisis mobile teams 
trained in de-escalation to show up instead of the police. Um, and um, so this is a picture of CAHOOTS. It's a um, program that's been active in the state of Oregon for over 40 years. It's a mobile crisis unit. And they typically provide on-site assessments. They may evaluate for 5150 holds. Those are psychiatric holds. And they will do safety planning with the family. Um, sometimes they provide access to short-term treatments and referral to local resources. They may act as gatekeeper to inpatient hospitalizations. Some work in concert with the police and there are reporting requirements and others do not. And that's because in some areas, their focus is on um, dealing, sometimes dealing with um, substance abuse overdoses and getting those amazing medications there in a timely manner to people that can bring them back. Um, and what is available is going to vary by locality. Um, it's, um, and it, they're, we're seeing them in California now, they're rolling them out county by county. And it may be up to us to make sure that these units are skilled in dealing with severe autism. And again, I encourage you to speak up to your state representatives and ask them if there's a plan in, in, in place for mobile crisis units in your area. Um, this, this really got my attention, um, this article, and I first saw it in the um, National Council for Severe Autism Facebook page. It was an article about young people um, being housed in the emergency rooms of hospitals, and it was because they weren't really safe enough to be discharged to um, the community setting. And there literally was no place else for these folks to go. Some of them were on waiting lists for hospital units that had the ability to deal specifically with autism. Um, there was a report of a child being housed in one for almost a year. The staff um, in, in these ER units weren't really um, able to um, or skilled in handling these kids. Um, they were, some of them were over sedated. One was strapped to um, a, um, I guess, to an ER bed um, for over a week. And um, uh, and so it, this, this broke my heart and it got my attention in a very big way. It, it was an amazing piece of journalism. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Um, so um, like in response to some of this stuff or maybe it was just going on at the same time, um, I found this very innovative program that was going, they had contracted the Bancroft School in New Jersey. They had contracted with three large metropolitan hospitals um, nearby and they were providing a um, high level of support to their clients with, AS, with severe ASD. Um, they had one piece of the program, they were available on call to emergency rooms and they provided ABA type care and intervention to those in the ER who were exhibiting challenging behaviors. Some of them needed medical treatment and but they couldn't comply. Um, they advised the hospital staff on sensory and space issues um, and um, uh, they also, they advised medical units and also psychiatric units that really weren't versed in treating severe autism. And they worked one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on behavior issues to those with it, severe autism um, in, in their, their psych units. For those with severe A ASD that needed um, medical procedures, um, in hospital settings, they were able to schedule those in advance and meet with some of the, the clients in advance and build rapport and elicit co cooperation from them. And this, interestingly, I was like, it, was this billed directly through to insurance? And they said, no. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, because some of those, um, those, those codes that Lori was using would have come in very much in handy. And they said that they, um, the use of them, they were paid directly. They were contracted directly with the hospital. And it was 
justified, they could justify it budgetarily because they reduce staff injuries over time and the amount of staff needed to care for clients. So ultimately, um, they kind of worked themselves out of a job and they ended up training staff to safely and competently work with the populations. Um, and so that was a success story and I loved hearing about that program. Um, but they are open to um, taking the show on the road and um, introducing it in other areas. So I can put you in touch with them if you want more information to try to, to make that available in local hospitals that have been um, poorly handling uh, populations. Um, so these are some known risk factors for um, inpatient hospitalization for those with severe ASD. There's nothing really surprising here. Functioning um, challenges in adapt um, ASD symptom severity, those at the higher end of the, um, the, the, the more impacted end of the, the ASD spectrum. Marital status, um, uh, single, sing, being single primary caregiver. Uh, presence of mood disorders, um, obviously comorbidity and sleep problems. This was a study done in 2018. Um, so these are known risk factors for inpatient hospitalization. One of the things I learned in, um, get, in preparing this talk with the, is that there is a, an autism inpatient research collaborative. I suspect that some of the uh, groups that Lori had on her list um, are also on this list. And this is um, from 2016. And there's a few new units that have um, recently formed as well. Um, I love this story. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to. Yes, I am. Hopefully, I'm, I'm going to be able to present it. It's an embedded <sighs> video. Thank you. News 8 at noon starts now. Coming your way next at noon, shot in the arm for the only inpatient facility in the state treating children with autism. We'll have the details. Welcome back. News 8 at noon continues now with a big boost for the state's only inpatient hospital treating children with autism. The state bonding commission has approved millions of dollars in new funding. News 8's Ken Pierce live in our New Haven newsroom. And Ken, this uh, could have been overlooked, correct? Uh, that's right. Last week, this was item 13 on the bond commission agenda. Item 15 was that $10 million study of highway tolls. That got a lot of attention from people who didn't think it was a smart way to spend $10 million. Maybe you'll think item number 13 was a better use of money. Yeah. Hey, can you give up a high five? Seven-year-old Ellis is on the end of the autism spectrum where he doesn't speak and he can be a danger to himself and his family. All they could do was take him to the emergency room. So we were stuck in this really terrible cycle of drifting from um, crisis to crisis. And, uh, and quite often we felt as though we were returning to our home and our, our home was on fire. Then he was lucky enough to get Ellis into the inpatient autism unit at the hospital for special care. We are the only TV crew ever allowed inside it and it is the only inpatient autism unit in Connecticut. So we see kids 24 hours a day. We have parents on our unit daily training with us and really getting to know them in one of the most difficult times in their lives when their child is in crisis. And while last week everyone was focused on the state bond commission approving $10 million to study highway tolls, there was another $10 million approved to expand autism treatment at HSC. Right now we, have, we are at uh, eight beds. Um, there is a waiting list sometimes for seven to eight patients. And uh, unfortunately, most of those patients are waiting in the emergency room. That's where 14-year-old Aiden was five weeks ago. Then he came here and is doing much better. By talking with doctors and talking with like clinicians and stuff like that and working with my mom on the things that I need to do. Like what? What have you learned? To like, use coping skills to space when you need to as they act appropriately. The change in him, I, I, I stand in awe. He did so much work. Um, and five weeks later, we're heading home today. Ellis's dad didn't know if his boy would ever safely live at home, but he can now. None of that would have been possible. Ellis would not be where he is today had it not been for that. And the bond money is going to let them expand from eight to at least 12 beds. But more than that, they're going to be single rooms because kids on the spectrum, they can have difficulty sharing spaces. Autism treatment will also have its own part of the campus with its own kid-friendly entrance as well. Live in the newsroom, I'm Kent Pierce. Keith, back to you. Kent, thank you. Great story. I love that story. So let me get, let me, next slide. There we go. Ooh, um, okay. So, whoops. Okay. Um, 
So what do these programs offer? Well, immediate stabilization. Um, they offer a comprehensive um, psychiatric and um, psychological um, functional behavior assessments, speech OT, ABA, special education assessments, um, usually a multidisciplinary package of assessments and a treatment plan. Um, and the parents, um, they work very closely with the parents in training them and um, to generalize skills that, that they've learned to bring it out into, um, into the home setting. Um, and then they give the parents a lot of resources for outpatient supports in the community. And um, they often use ABA type of approaches and the psychiatric um, according to the literature that I read, it said that their goal is to reduce the psychiatric medication as much as possible, but that they're still functional and, and get the benefit of it, but they don't try to drug them up. Um, and they have slightly longer lengths of stay than, than other um, mental health units, um, inpatient units. And usually it's about, um, on average, these places had um, 25 to 30 days. Now the Kennedy Krieger Institute is a little bit different um, and they have a much longer length of stay. Um, and then many of these programs have a partial hospital program that is like 25 hours a week. Um, that they go to five days a week, five hours a day. And um, it can be used either to prevent inpatient hospitalization um, before they go in, or if they don't, they can divert having to go in, or they can be used um, uh, as step down on their way out to transition them gradually to another, to the out, outpatient setting. Um, so uh, when compared to uh, those in the mainstream psych units, those treated in these facilities had um, lower, um, a much lower uh, aberrant behavior and irritability scores, um, two months post discharge and a reduction in um, ER visits uh, two months later when compared to those um, of a similar functional level that were treated in the regular um, inpatient hospital set setting. And that, that results in significant cost savings and trauma savings to the family. Um, so the potential, the biggest barrier is there just aren't enough of these in the country and they're clustered on the East Coast, uh, mainly in the Northeast and they have huge waiting lists. Um, they are covered by um, a lot of commercial insurance, but commercial insurance does try to limit lengths of stay and they can put up other obstacles. Um, the, the program in Connecticut, um, they give priority to in-state residents. Um, and then some of them, in some states, they are covered by Medicaid and Medicaid waiver programs, but that varies completely from state to state. So some of the things that Arzu said, I believe are specific to Washington state, um, including being able to get uh, ABA for those over 21. Um, so if there's nothing in your state, I encourage you again to get involved um, with your state representative and also your state de developmental disability department. Ultimately, it's about uh, money priorities um, and, um, and we know there's huge need. So, um, so treating our loved ones in these units ultimately saves everybody money. Um, we may have to make it happen. Um, this, this project in Connecticut was the project of like many, many people, including parents, professionals, politicians, uh, educators, um, you know, it really, and, and the parity law does support it. Um, and most often they're um, affiliated with, they're part of a specialized treating hospital, uh, specialized children's hospitals, the ones for children, um, tertiary care facilities, and they're often affiliated with a teaching hospital. So um, who will pay? So residential treatment, the next part of this presentation is about residential treatment. And um, residential treatment is usually of a much longer duration. They can be up to a few years. They can be known as therapeutic boarding schools. Um, they can be licensed with the state education department and also licensed with either the, head, the health department or the board of ed. They often have residential treatment licenses and educational licenses. Um, 
for children, either the whole or the educational um, portion can be covered by the school district. And again, that varies by state in terms of how successful you're gonna be um, in terms of being able to uh, realize uh, to get that covered. In some states, the room and board portion can be covered by Medicaid. It really depends on whether your Medicaid program covers long-term care. Um, for adults, some uh, developmental disability departments will fund some of these programs or portions of the program. And some private health plans will pay for residential treatment, but they often will pay for a limited duration. Their view of it is that you should be out in 30 to 60 days. And um, you know the WIT case hopefully will have some bearing on that, but this is what we're seeing on a regular basis in this sector. And this is something I do a lot of. I write appeals for families trying to get this kind of coverage. Um, so with private insurance, um, most networks don't have, um, they're not in network. Well, yeah, so the residential treatment programs, a lot of them are not in network. And so it's up to you to show your, um, your to work closely with a care manager and show them that they're, the facilities can't manage your severely disabled child and you need a single case agreement and you may need to make that work on the other end with the facility as well. Um, and um, working with these um, uh, insurance companies for residential treatment, it often requires a process of ongoing weekly utilization review. And that can be kind of onerous um, for the facility. We, we do that service as well for people if they need it um, with permission from the facility, but it can be um, hard on the facility because they have to continue to justify. Um, once care is denied, we prepare an appeal and sometimes we go to external review and sometimes we um, hand them off to attorneys. Um, it just depends on the strength of the case and what's going on. Um, but the, here's the kicker. It often requires out of work, paying out of pocket while the attorneys work the case. And that right there is a deal breaker for a lot of families. They just can't pay out of pocket. Um, some plans are harder to work with than others. Um, but most will want to get you out within a few weeks, which is why I always tell families to explore what their, their school district will, will offer if their loved one is under age 21, uh, 22 rather. Um, so federal and state parity laws have amazing potential, um, but it's not trickling down in the ways that we need. We see successful lawsuits, but um, in terms of what's readily available, it, we don't see a lot of it. We need um, better laws that incorporate the principles of the WIT case. Um, and um, as described, we have this in California, but we're still not seeing it. And that's, that's another story. Um, and ironically, if you can find health plans for failing to follow the law, it will more than pay for the salaries of those that are enforcing it. So it's worth it for um, enforcement agencies, government agencies to better enforce the law and fine them for, um, for not following it. Now, school districts, I encourage people to keep their child on an IEP through age 22, keep communication lines open with the district. It's best to give them warning if you're going to enroll your child in a non-public school. If you haven't got them to agree to it, you should give them warning in advance. Um, and you know, I, I think that others have talked about IDEA and how they're required to provide a free and appropriate public education. And you're likely to need a SPED attorney to help you get this placement covered. And this amazing organization called COPAA, .org. They have a list of, um, of SPED attorneys and advocates by state. Um, and some states do not have enough um, SPED attorneys and they don't have a lot of case law. So it can be harder to win um, in, um, in a hearing. Um, let's see. And so this is describes a little bit about the residential treatment programs. Um, they um, have secure home-like buildings um, with a similar group of peers, often like the units are small so that they, they look like and feel like homes. Um, often parents are involved in weekly virtual sessions and they may have monthly visits. Um, 
and um, they try to keep the, as Arzu said, they try to keep the programs, the day activities highly structured and keep the kids occupied, but they're also individualized to the needs of the students. Um, and they develop um, individualized behavior plans and they continually update their treatment plans. And the goal is to gradually transition them to lower levels of care. Um, and they go home for trial visits to see how it's do doing. So are we still in the dark ages? Yeah, we really are because there's not nearly enough programs to serve those who need them. We still have to fight to get them paid for. We still need better enforcement of our mental health and autism laws and also IDEA. We need it fully funded. We still have to get involved, speak up to legislators, speak to the press, raise awareness, raise money, advocate and make it happen. And and Jill, yeah, you can never die. You still can't ever die. Um, but now at least we're starting to see some solutions. We're starting to see innovative programs and there's more awareness and there's a little bit of light. So that's my talk. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, great information. Um, we have, let's see, five minutes left. So um, I'm going to tear through a few questions and then I, I'm gonna have some general questions for the panel. Um, how can someone from Florida access one of these crisis places? They are out of state and my care coordinator has said that since they are out of state, nothing can be done. Your care coordinator through your health plan or your care coordinator through what? I was wondering that too, she didn't say. I'm okay. guessing it's, it's health, health plan, I'm guessing. If it's through your health plan, if there's nothing in state, then they have to look out of state and file a, um, an appeal uh, based on that, that there's no programs that are appropriate in, in your network and in your state. And so then they have to lift the restriction and go out of state. Um, developmental disabilities pr uh, programs sometimes give a real hard time with that. I, I am familiar with that. Yes. Um, yeah. And with regards to appeals, of course, we've all had the experience that some of our insurers are just insta deniers, mm -hmm. right? It's just sort of like, it's almost routine, deny, deny, deny. And they know that, you know, an appeal will be that push that will, you know, make them actually act. But um, that is the sad truth. Right. And sometimes you have, it's more than the appeal. It's the either external review or mm -hmm. getting a litigator involved, an insurance attorney. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, and it's a, it's a shame that that's the reality, and that is the reality. Is it possible to contact the panelists via email who have expertise specifically in SF Bay Area resources? I'm in SF Bay Area. My 11 year old son currently resides in crisis group home in that area. Mm -hmm. um, any of the panelists, maybe they can talk to Karen. I mean, you're in the Bay Area, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, and you're easy to reach because um, your your website is mhautism.org, mental health autism, mhautism.org. So you can email Karen there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. Um, I came in late. I've started a complaint with DMHC against Blue Shield for not covering ABA 24 five-hour week program. My son has severe autism. He will need therapies the rest of his life. I have a settlement with the district till he's 22. Um, and, and he's no longer a student. So I think he, she's talking about after he ages out. Uh, D DDS and regional center, regional center. They, they should um, pick up some of it. It might be, it might not look exactly the way it's looked through insurance, but they should, they should stay with you. I mean, that's for life. Yeah, this is California. So, yeah. but California, sorry, I, I, to push this, California regional centers, will say, no, you have to use generic resources first. You have to access your health insurance before we pay. Yeah, so, and California will pay. Your private insurance will pay. Uh, it's Medicaid that, that will give you a hard time. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Um, my daughter is currently in residential placement. What would be the next tier down? Not sure what she means uh, by that with elementary age before coming home. Uh, well, it would be um, a, a PHP, partial hospital program, or a specialized um, day school 
like once she comes home, I mean, the, the idea is that, so if she's not ready to come home, then she needs to stay there, but you should be doing practice home visits. That's something that you, they do towards the end of the residential treatment stay. And then depending on how well she does with that, then that would set, that would determine. Okay. Ready. One more question that I'm gonna ask everybody to, oh, can you stop sharing your slides? Karen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, have, have everybody come back on. Um, Arzu, somebody wants your contact information. If they look up Washington Autism Alliance, they can probably email yeah. you there unless there's something else you prefer. Um, yes, they can find me through our website or CEO at WashingtonAutismAdvocacy.org. Okay. All right. We are like literally at the end of our second hour. Um, so here's a question. Um, you know, we've talked about our beloved friend Feda, and um, you know, before she passed away, you know, Feda, Feda never took no for an answer, as Karen pointed <laughs> out. Um, you know, Muhammad had you know a, a two, two or three people on him, you know, at all times, even during the pandemic. She really managed to get the support that he desperately needed, and and. Unfortunately, it didn't keep her safe enough, um, but you know, it, during the day, at least they were safe. It, he was not in an inpatient program. He was not admitted to a residential program, but she found supports for a very, very severe young man. Um, what is your advice to parents who don't wanna place their children, but nevertheless are living with this amount of violence, aggression, self-injury, property destruction, um, to, to uh -huh. get more supports in the home? Uh, wraparound services. Um, yep. It's called uh, TBS in California, uh, Therapeutic Behavioral Services. Um, it's available through Medicaid and the Medicaid waiver and, and also um, protection, protective services. What, what is that called? Protective supervision? Like yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah. that's dinky. That's dinky. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, there's someone is, there. Okay. I, I would be careful about protective supervision because you, you um, it's typically for, for people who have, um, uh, that need community protection. So I, I would be careful to um, have someone labeled as, as an individual who needs community protection. It's mm -hmm. typically for people who have um, um, sexual, for sexual predators. Oh, in California, oh, it's different. No. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that's not what it means here. That might be something oh. Washington specific. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, to, to speak to not getting outnumbered so that you can avoid residential placement. Mm -hmm. um, it is, like you said, it's really, really important to have two, three people at all times to make sure everyone stays safe. And the number of the staffing, <clears throat> as, as Lori mentioned, there are CPT codes that are used for, <clears throat> for addressing severe challenging behaviors. It's important to have really honest communication with agencies that are serving you to make sure that they understand what is needed. Because if the agency doesn't have the experience of um, working with significant challenging behaviors, they may not ask for the right number of staff. So it's important for you to, to find the right agencies who get it and know to ask for additional staff ratios. Lori, did you want to? Oh, I 100% agree with what Arzu said. Um, Harkening back to your question, though, Jill, and just thinking about Feta and, and how hard she fought for, for her son, um, I guess I have a little bit more of a philosophical answer to the question of, of what do you do to get that protection, and that is tell your story in a really effective way. And I think that's that was Feta's... Mm -hmm gift, one of her gifts, one of her many gifts, mm -hmm. um, was, you know, the insurance companies would have you believe that there are these hard and fast rules, when really, the only real rule is they'll only pay for what's medically necessary. Well, if you tell the story of how you're living in your home, as well as Feta told her story, um, then you have a better chance of helping them understand why this is medically necessary for you in your circumstances. Like I, I just listening to today's question or reading the questions really and, and listening to people that I talk to all the time, you know, they'll say, 
the insurance company said, you don't get anything after this age, or you can't get anything out of state, or you can't get this. Most of the time, those aren't actually rules. Somebody's just telling you that. Mm -hmm. And they're checking to see, are you going to fight back? And the right. sad, the sad truth is we're a community. It, it's really hard for us to fight back. Not that we're not feisty. We're tired because we're dealing with our kids mm -hmm. behaviors and whatnot um, all day long. You know, the last thing you want to do is more paperwork and they know that. So, um, you know, my, my, what I encourage is really just to not take no for an answer and don't assume that something is a rule just because you got a denial on that basis. Anytime anybody asks me, you know, can the insurance company do that? I, I say, you have to tell me the basis on which they denied it. What was the reason they gave? And a lot of the time, it's not even a valid reason. That's your basis for appeal. And, and if you don't appeal, they win. They uh, win. And to the point about telling your story, I mean, we've had people contribute to our blog, telling their story, and then they use that you know, in their fight all right, to get coverage, sometimes from insurance, sometimes from other sources. And you're, it has been helpful. And our door is open to help families in that way to help tell yeah, their story. You're, I know we're out of time, but your blog yeah. is wonderful. I mean, I, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of this organization generally. It was so needed in our community um, for those of us who are dealing with this end of the spectrum and we can't have our voices silenced, but appeal, 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 and uh, you know, reach out to these organizations that can help you. Judith? I'll just add one more thing too. And you may think, oh, what? I don't have time for this, but get to know your legislators um, so that, that when they hear the word autism, they're not just thinking about people in suits and heels walking around Washington, DC, but, but they're thinking about your kid and their severe behaviors. It's so important that they hear those stories and they can lean on state departments of insurance. They can lean on the Medicaid agencies and make them do the right thing. Um, so if you're not sure who your legislators are, you know, you can just Google who are my legislators and you'll have state legislators and you'll have federal legislators. When they have any kind of events, like if they're out on if the library as things are opening back up, take your loved one with severe autism, let them experience severe autism in person that people need to understand what this looks like especially legislators and regulators. So get our loved ones out in the community. You may think like, oh no, I can't do that. And if it's hard on your loved one, if it's traumatic, please don't. But if at all possible, we need to have some more authentic awareness out there with our loved ones who are, are experiencing these challenging behaviors themselves. We fully, fully agree with that. Um, okay, and then the last question um, for everybody is, um, Okay, uh, actually, you know what, we're really out of time. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was gonna pitch it. I'm like, uh, no, we're seven minutes out. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna post this, I'm gonna post everybody's slides um, and um, what, whatever contact information you wanna provide so the people who didn't get their, an their questions answered, they can contact you directly. Um, and I'm so sorry, because actually I, I do have so many more, qu more questions inside of me, but let's do this again. Like, let's see if we can do this again next year and update everybody and, um, and get at some more of these issues. So thank you so, so, so much, everyone. Um, wonderful to see you all uh, in 2D, hopefully next time in 3D. Yes, thank all you. All right, you. signing off. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.